Hello, thanks for watching. What I want to talk about today is John Polkinghorne. So this fits into the Christianity and science topic in year two. And Polkinghorne's quite a big deal because they can set questions on him. And he's got quite a few different um, arguments about the relationship between religion and science that you can be asked about. So it's worth knowing his arguments in a little bit of depth. So this will be a short one, but I'll take you through the main points. What you can see straight away, because I've got it here, Christianity and science, according to Polkinghorne, they're not enemies. They, they can be totally compatible with each other. So just a tiny bit about John Polkinghorne. Um, I was actually lucky enough to meet him a couple of times. Um, he was a great, great um, thinker. Um, he died in 2021. Um, he was based in Cambridge and he was a particle physicist and an ordained Anglican priest. So you can see there a very, very high level scientist, but also a priest in the Church of England. And he saw no conflict, was no conflict whatsoever between those two um, roles. So let's get into the arguments that he's got. So he's got three. All of these are arguments about why he thinks Christianity is compatible with science. So the first one is about the intelligibility of the universe. And what he means by intelligibility is the fact that we've got a universe that we can make sense of. It's not chaotic. It's quite ordered. It's um, quite predictable. And he thinks that it's very, very surprising that this is the case. The second one is about God being providential. Now, providential just means that he provides for us. So God is kind and loving. Um, God looks after us. But this is quite crucial. Polkinghorn thinks that this happens in a way that we can't really perceive. He thinks it's happening at the quantum level of the universe. Um, and this is important because this gets rid of some of the traditional philosophical problems of God intervening. So if we put this with perhaps what we've learned about miracles and why miracles are a little bit philosophically iffy, that might actually help you with that as well. And then thirdly, the idea that religion and science are just two different ways of looking at the same ultimate truth. So it's kind of like you're looking at the same thing, but just through two different pairs of glasses. And because you're looking at the same thing, that doesn't need to be any conflict. So I'm going to unpack these for you now. OK, the first one, the intelligibility of the universe. So on the slides, you can see a shortened John Polkinghorne to JP. He argues that we can make sense of the universe. And you can't really argue with that because to a large extent we can. We've got an ordered universe. We've got a predictable universe. We've got a universe that appears to follow a certain amount of laws. Polkinghorne finds this incredibly unlikely. The chances of such a universe occurring accidentally, um, he estimates that it's 10 to the 180th power. So just to put that in context for you, that's 10 with 180 zeros after it. So the chances of that happening all on its own are incredibly unlikely. He thinks it's more likely that there's a rational creator. And he backs that up by saying that the rationality of the universe must indicate that there's a rational creator. It wouldn't be rational all by itself. And then a little bit about evolution. So he's, he's completely down with evolution. He thinks evolution happened. It's factually correct. But what he points out is that it doesn't explain everything. Evolution doesn't explain why humans do things that we feel are very valuable and very important and big parts of being human, yet not really geared towards survival. So to an extent, yeah, we are survival machines, but to an extent, we're also not. It doesn't really explain why we paint pictures and write poetry. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but simplistic is all we need right now. But there's a couple of problems with this. So multiverse theory is a problem. Multiverse theory, very simply put, is the idea that this isn't the only universe. There are thousands, millions, billions of other universes kind of simultaneously existing. If this is the only universe, then Polkinghorne's probably right. But if it isn't the only universe, 
that damages his argument that this universe is very special because if it's just one among billions then it's just one among billions and we got lucky he dismisses this kind of multiple universe theory on the basis that other universes can't be observed so he basically says well you can't say that there are multiverses because we can't observe them that's bad science but you also can't observe god and he's using god in his argument so you have to make up your mind about how convincing you find all of that. OK. His second sort of thread of arguments is to do with God providing for us. So God's providential action in the universe at the quantum level. So his starting point is to say that God has to be providential. God has to look after us, because if God doesn't love us, what even is Christianity? Christianity has no factual concept because Christianity is all about God being loving. But again, this is where we've got our overlap with miracles. Polkinghorne argues God doesn't intervene fussily, so he's not kind of constantly tinkering with the world as we experience it. But he is working and he is making changes. He's doing it at the quantum level, though. Now, I don't know very much about quantum physics, and you don't need to either. But the quantum level is kind of like the absolute smallest level of reality there is. And we can't detect it. Physicists have hypothesized that it has to be there, but we can't engage with it. We can't sort of detect it properly. Polking argues that this level, this quantum level, is where God works. Therefore, he's doing it, but we can't tell. Now, if this is true, this would work quite nicely because this would show that God is providing for us, but maintaining epistemic distance. And philosophically, of course, we have to have epistemic distance. We have to have this um, kind of situation where we can't know for sure that God exists. Otherwise, belief in God wouldn't mean anything. So that's quite nice and neat. But here are the problems. It doesn't matter how wonderfully subtle God is with his actions. If he's acting to provide for some but not for others, as appears to be the case because we don't live in a fair universe, then this takes us back to the logical problem of evil. Why would a loving God allow evil in the world if he could stop it? And then a little shout out to the parable of the gardener here, which you probably know from elsewhere in the course. What's the difference between a God whose actions we can't see, sense and experience because they're happening at the quantum level, and no God at all. If there's no way of us experiencing God and God's actions, why would we hypothesise that there's even a God at all? Now, I'm just pointing out these criticisms to sort of put it on your radar that just because Polkinghorne's making good points, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's right. But, you know, we're obviously in AOT territory here, so you have to make up your mind as to how convincing you find any of this. OK, last one. So this is to do with the relationship and the interaction of science and theology. So ultimately, Polkinghorne thinks that they're about the same thing. They're both just different ways of making sense of the universe. Scientists are trying to make sense of the universe. So are theologians. So far, no conflict. Now, he sees religious experiences as encounters with ultimate truth. So there is kind of an ultimate truth out there, but depending on your background and um, your religious background, you might experience it through different cultural lenses. So what I mean by this is, you know, a, a Catholic might have a vision of Mary, a Hindu might have a vision of Krishna. They're ultimately ex experiencing the same thing, just through a different lens. And he thinks that evidence for the claims made about Jesus can be found in the Gospels and that this evidence needs to be examined using reason. So we almost need to look scientifically at the Gospels. And many people have tried to do that. They've tried to think, OK, well, where's the agreement? Where's the disagreement? Where's the historical context? And to be fair, there is quite a lot of stuff you can do with the Gospels if you look at it like that. But it might be a bit of a stretch to say that it takes us ultimately to truth. And there's a couple of problems with this as well. Polkinghorne was a Christian. 
but he's possibly undermined Christianity with this argument, because if religious experiences are just all the same but culturally conditioned, surely Christianity is just another one of these lenses and is no more valid than any other religion or any other worldview. So, I mean, he might be fine with this, but what this criticism is essentially saying is that there's no value in being Christian. And then there's another problem with what he says about the Gospels. He argues that to treat the book of Genesis as rational and scientific is clearly wrong. Um, he said that, you know, if you treat it like a piece of science, you're actually abusing the text because it's not science, it's theology. But yet he seems to be saying that we can treat the Gospels quite scientifically. Belief in Jesus is belief. It's not really a scientific hypothesis. We can say with a reasonable amount of confidence that Jesus existed and that he was a rabbi and that he was crucified. But to take it much beyond that, we're in we're into faith. We have to be into faith there. Um, it's not a scientific kind of thing that you can arrive at. All right. So that's it on Polkinghorne for now. I hope that's been useful. Um, more stuff coming soon. I'm getting it out as quickly as I can, but please be patient because I'm also teaching at the same time. Um, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.